turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. It's been long enough. We can go back to Mark now for a, for a message um, before we get back into our Thessalonians uh, study. Mark chapter 4. I want to look at verses 35 through 41 today. Make sure that's on. We read in, in Scripture in Hebrews eleven six 6 that without faith it's impossible to please God for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him and we also read in Proverbs 9 10 a verse that's been coming up a lot in my own personal devotions the fear of the Lord the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding we don't often think about fear and faith being essential to our walk with God but Scripture tells us they're both very much necessary. To follow Christ faithfully, we must have a fear of God. To, call, to follow Christ faithfully, we must, we must have faith that actually comes from fearing God. Wisdom and understanding, it tells us, comes from knowing God, from fearing God. And we often lack faith because we fear other things more than we fear God. Those other things are more impressive to us than our God is. And so we disobey, we disregard, we're, we're distracted by those things. We're not focused on God. Our faith is weak because we're prone to forget how awesome and how great our God is. Certainly as we gather on Sunday mornings, hopefully we are reminded of God's greatness. But often as we go out and live our lives um, in our sin-cursed world, we're distracted by trials, by problems, by struggles, by different cares, by different storms of life. And, and it's easy to forget how awesome our God really is. And that's when we start to lose heart. That's when our faith becomes weak and it needs to be strengthened. Then when we face uncertainty, we face difficulty, we receive that dreaded diagnosis or we receive that dreaded phone call when the pain doesn't seem to go away, in those moments, I think we become even less convinced of God's greatness. Yet it's in those moments of difficulty and hardship that God often chooses to work in our lives to show us exactly how great he is. And that's what I want us to see in our text today, where we see fear and faith combined. As we consider at least one more passage before we get to 1 Thessalonians, we're going to look again at Mark chapter 4. It's been a while since we've been in the book of Mark, but we did spend a great deal of time in this gospel. So you might remember that Mark writes so that his readers would see who Jesus is, uh, that they would see how awesome and great he is. And in our text today, we definitely see that. We see the greatness of our God. And, and that greatness is meant to give us a fear of him that strengthens our faith in him. And so to grow in our fear and to grow in our faith, we must see God for who he is, that he is greater than anything else in life, that he's greater than even our trials. So let's look together at the greatness of our God as seen here in this very familiar encounter here in Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. It says, In the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for just the privilege, the opportunity to, to be able to, first of all, have uh, your word in our language, so that we can see you, so that we can understand uh, your greatness, your glory, your goodness, your grace. And, and Father, we pray that as we look into this passage of scriptures, that you would, this, that you would open our, our hearts, open our, our minds, 
uh, and help us to, to see you. Help us to see your greatness. Help us to see your glory. Help us to grow in our faith because of what we see here. And Father, we pray that you would give wisdom, guidance, and clarity as I, as I speak, and that you would accomplish your will and your purpose for each and every one of us that are here today. And we pray ultimately that you would receive all the glory because you deserve it. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so up to this point, if you remember in Mark's narrative, Jesus has really been teaching his followers in the classroom, so to speak. And now it's time for a pop quiz, which how many of you like pop quizzes? You don't, got, you, don't, you don't get a chance to study for pop quizzes, so I don't think any of us like pop quizzes. All right, Nate likes pop quizzes. All right. Well, one of us likes pop quizzes, but I don't know that the disciples were too thrilled with this pop quiz here. And Jesus is going to give them a hands-on experience in order for them to, to grow their faith. And again, to grow that faith, he's going to show them his greatness. As he's going to use a, a great storm and a great calm to produce a great fear that should lead to great faith. And that's the idea here. And so let's look at this, this pop quiz or this test that our great God gives to his followers. And the first thing that we see is a great storm, which is going to bring up a great question. And so the same day, when even was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they sent the multitude away, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also other little ships with them. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship. So that the, the, the ship was now full, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and they say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And if you're familiar with, with Mark, you're familiar with Jesus, you know, he's been teaching all day long. He's exhausted, and so he calls to his disciples, and he says, let's, let's go over to the other side. Well, let's get away from the crowds for a little bit. And, and so they're in this, this boat, uh, which depending on who you read, may have been a fairly small boat or a decent-sized boat, uh, one that was discovered uh, in 1986, um, dated between 120 B.C. and 40 A.D., quite a range. Um, it was a boat that was 26 and a half feet long, so decent size, 7 and a half feet wide, uh, 4 and a half feet high. Um, and, and there was a place to sit down, a place to lie down, um, could hold 15 people, so perhaps that's the size of this boat. Um, it's not a little canoe that they're crammed in. I mean, there's some, there's a little bit of space, but if you get all 12 in there, it's pretty tight. Um, it would certainly fit what we're, we're seeing here, but there's other little boats with them as well. And so probably other followers going along uh, for the ride, going across the other side. But here Jesus is able to get away from the crowds for a little bit. And we're able to get away from the multitudes and he's going to get some rest as we're going to see in a few minutes, few minutes, because in verses 35 and 36, we have no reason to believe that this is anything but peaceful, right? This is restful, it's serene, at least that's how I picture it. All is calm, Jesus is tired, perfect conditions for rest. And Luke writes in his account, as they sailed, he fell asleep. That's how peaceful it is. You've been there, right? There's a breeze sailing across the sea. Uh, just the other day, we were, uh, I was taking the boys to a, a doctor's appointment a Friday afternoon. And it was, the sun was shining, the car was warm, we had just had lunch, and it was quiet in the car. So I just assumed everybody around me was sleeping. I think Valerie almost fell asleep. The kids in the back were almost asleep. I was almost asleep. Uh, <laughs> it was the perfect conditions uh, for sleep after an eventful uh, week. And same is true here. Perfect conditions for a nap. And so as they, began, as they set out on their journey peaceful, everything is good. Out of nowhere, it tells us, a great storm comes up, right? Verses, uh, let's see here, I'll turn my page. Uh, verse 37, and there arose almost out of nowhere a great storm of wind and the waves now beat into the ship. So, so much for a restful journey across the sea, so much so now that you got waves starting to come on the ship, beating the ship. The, the, the ship is filling up with water, it tells us, and so that it's now full in verse 37. But this type of storm is, is not unusual on the Sea of Galilee. And the sea is actually a freshwater lake, but it's called the sea because of its tidal patterns. 
um, and the fact that it acts more like a sea than a lake. It's nearly 700 feet below sea level, surrounded by hills, surrounded by mountains, and so it kind of sits in this little bowl at the bottom of these mountains, and because of its location, it's known for strong winds and strong storms. In the summer, uh, apparently, the winds are blowing pretty much every day off the mountains, sort of disrupting things. The winter, though, apparently was worse because of cold winds coming down with the warm, uh, uh, the warm air down below, and it creates these violent, treacherous storms like the one that we're going to see here in our text. So no matter what time of the year you're sailing, you could always be in for an unexpected adventure, I guess we'll say. But especially in the winter months. Well, we know about unexpected adventures in the winter months, right? But so, so people are aware of the potential storms and the potential dangers that would pop up unexpected, unannounced. Um, and so, but they would obviously have to go and sail anyway. So you just didn't know. Um, and, and the waves I read could get anywhere from five to 10 feet high, which is unheard of on a lake. Uh, and, and so here's Jesus. Here's his disciples, middle of this calm boat ride, when all of a sudden this great windstorm rises up out of the blue. Luke says the storm descends down onto the lake. A treacherous, dangerous storm. A storm that the fishermen would have been very familiar with. They would have known about these things. And, and in their mind, these storms you don't want to be a part of, because if you're there, it means you're dead. You're not making it out alive, probably. You don't want to be stuck in one of these storms. And Mark uses the, a Greek word which means huge storm, a mega storm. And the word storm is a, a word for a whirlwind or a cyclone. Often used to describe a, a fierce uh, gale or a, or a hurricane. So we're getting the idea that these winds are very strong. 70, who knows, 70 miles an hour with giant waves. And so this is not just you know, a little breeze. This is a, a huge storm. And while all this is going on, where is Jesus? Where is he? Verse 38, he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. He's asleep. He's still sleeping. And we get a picture of his humanity here. He's tired. He's exhausted from all of his work. We know he's been teaching. He's been preaching. And I can attest that that is exhausting work. It will wear you out in ways that you can't even imagine how tired. And, and we know that Jesus often get up early to, right, to get away to, to pray. And so he's now got this chance to, to, to be away from the crowds, and so he's getting some sleep. But the question arises, what kind of man can sleep through a violent tempest? <laughs> Have you ever been so sleepy that you could fall asleep in the middle of a hurricane on a, on a boat? That's pretty tired. I mean, I've been pretty tired before. I've slept through fire alarms at college, um, right? That's college. You, you, you stay up late studying and you wake up early for classes. So uh, I've slept, I've fallen asleep during arts and crafts at a summer camp on a table with kids uh, screaming. So, I mean, maybe that's worse than a hurricane. I don't know. But I can't, I'm not sure I could sleep through something like this. And it's interesting that this is the only time that we read of Jesus sleeping, and it's in the middle of a, of a terrifying storm. Everybody else is panicking all around him. Everything's chaotic, and he's just sleeping. He's getting a little shut-eye. His disciples are not thrilled that he's chosen now for his slumber either. And so they interpret his nap as an indication that he doesn't care about them. Because in their time of need, he's not there. And so they go and they, they wake him up. And you know it's a rough day at sea when the fishermen are waking up the carpenter, right, for help. In verse 38, and so they, they awake him and they say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? They rush to Jesus, yelling at him, saying, Wake up, Lord, Master, teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? Save us. They're panicking. They're dreading their fate. Because in their mind, they're, they're convinced that this is the end. It's interesting, too, that they waited for the, uh, the uh, boat to be filled right before they asked for help. Um, isn't that the way it is? I guess I finally need to ask for help. But here, they're, they're desperately trying to wake him up. And, and I just picture this, this completely complete chaos. 
right? It's loud. Men are screaming for their lives. Waves are, are crashing. The, the wind is howling. And Jesus is asleep. He's the picture of, of perfect peace here. But all of that's broken up with, Master, don't you care that we're going to die? And that language probably sounds a little bit familiar to you because last week, Martha rebuked Jesus, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Same idea. They're rebuking Jesus just like Martha did. They're not happy with what he's doing, just like Martha wasn't happy with what Jesus was allowing. Same idea. Matthew softens it a little bit, but no doubt this is exactly what was said. Perhaps Peter's the one that was the loudest since Mark and Peter worked closely. They're frustrated. They're scared. And you know what it feels like when anxiety gets the best of you? It turns to anger very quickly, doesn't it? And you start to lash out because you realize that you're not in control. And that's a scary thing. You're scared. And they're scared. And so they're yelling at God. Don't you care? It's, it's uncomfortable. We've all been there. And anxiety and anger are very closely related. We don't like to think that. A lot of times when you're mad, it's because you're scared. And these men are scared. Because they're going to die and Jesus doesn't care. At least that's how they interpret it. What is wrong with you? It, right? What are you doing? Why aren't you helping us? That's the tone of their question. This is no time to sleep. This is time to panic. Why aren't you panicking? We are. And so they fear for their lives. Jesus is doing nothing to help them. They're seemingly on their own. What are we doing? Right? That's what's happening. And to, to go along with the fact that Jesus is asleep, this storm didn't exactly happen by accident. I don't think it caught Jesus off guard for a second. Right? It's not like if Jesus looked at the Doppler radar or if he had the weather channel, he would have said, you know what? Let's not go today. There's a storm that's going to show up. No, Jesus knows exactly what he's doing, just like he always does. Because he is sovereign over everything. He's the one in charge. We read in Psalm 107, verses 24 and 25, These see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. And so you know what that's saying? saying that Jesus is in complete control. He's the one that brought them into this storm. And now, though, he seems unconcerned. He seems like he doesn't care. He's indifferent toward my plight. And so, Master, don't you care that we're going to die? What are you doing here? And because God is sovereign and he often allows us to go through trials and tribulations, we often have the same question. Don't you care? What are you doing? Why have you left me? Why are you doing this to me? These men are face to face with the, the realization that they can't change this. And that's a fearful thing. They're not in control. And again, sometimes that scares us. It scares us because we don't understand our God. We don't trust him to be in control. That's their problem. And so to them, Jesus is asleep at the wheel. He's not doing anything to help them. It's a, sim it's a similar thing. Uh, Martha, again, we're going to pick on Martha again. When Lazarus died, it simply, it's sim it's, she essentially says the same thing. Don't, don't you care? Because if you had been here, remember she says, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. He wouldn't have died if you had been here. It's your fault. Don't you care? We read a number of psalms that echo that same thought. In Psalm 10, the psalmist writes in relation to his situation, Why, O Lord, why do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 42, 9, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Again, where are you? Don't you care? <laughs> Interestingly, Psalm 44, 23 and 24 says this, Awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. 
Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and our oppression? And I'll give you one more. Psalm 88. Oh Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I'm helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me altogether. You've caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. That's what they're feeling here. We've probably all felt that. Habakkuk asks similar questions. Jeremiah, too, as they face difficulty and despair. As God's people turn their back on him and, and his judgment is imminent, the question is often, why do you seem so far away? Why aren't you coming to my rescue? Don't you care? And we ask the same question today as we look around in our broken world. We see, we see violence, senseless acts of violence. We see immorality. We see division. We see hatred. And then even in our personal lives, we deal with trials and things go from bad to worse. We can ask just like the disciples, just like the psalmist, where are you? Why are you sleeping? Don't you care? Things are out of our control. And we're often just as worried, just as fearful as these men in the boat. They're fearful because it seems like the evidence is pointing to, to being indifferent. That he doesn't care. He's asleep. Why did he send them out knowing that this would happen? Why did he allow these trials? Why did he allow these trials? Because again, Jesus is teaching. Jesus is always teaching. He's teaching them to lean on him. To trust him. To see him so that they would trust him. So that they might walk by faith and not by sight. To trust him and not their feelings, right? Their, their feelings are God doesn't care. Or clearly, he doesn't care. So, does Jesus care? Yeah, he does. But he cares about something greater than their comfort. Their biggest problem is not the storm, but they think it is. Their biggest problem is that they lack faith, that they're not really seeing who Jesus is. And so, that's the real problem that needs to be taken care of. And that's what Jesus is working towards. Sometimes we only see the problem right in front of us. But Jesus cares about something greater. Something greater than their comfort. Something greater than a, a smooth, peaceful, uneventful boat ride. He cares about their faith. He wants them to trust him. He wants them to see him. He wants them to know him. So that they could be at peace. And that's what we're going to see. Yes, they've heard Jesus preach, right? We, we, we know that. They saw Jesus do miraculous things. And probably they should have had more faith than they had. But I think we're all guilty of that. And so they're in the middle of this pop quiz, this test, this trial. They're at their wit ends. They're, they're certainly doomed. They're convinced that they're going to die. And so their faith needs strengthening. So does ours, right? I mean, we read, we see what Jesus can do. But often we doubt that he can actually help us when we have a real need. And that's where the disciples were. I mean, they've seen it done. In theory, it all makes sense and it sounds good. But when the rubber meets the road, their faith wasn't as strong as perhaps they thought it was. They're not, so in, in, in the classroom, it seems so believable. But when test, test time came, they're not so convinced. And so they wake Jesus up. And I'm not sure what they thought Jesus was going to do when they woke him up. But they're very shocked by what happens next. So we see the greatness of our God in the great storm. And now we see it in the great calm. And then we see a greater question, too. Look at, so look at how Jesus answers that, that question. Do you care? Verse 39, and he arose and he rebuked the wind, and he said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the, the wind ceased, and there was a great calm <laughs> on the outside. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? 
I don't know if they expected Jesus to pray. I don't know if he, they expected him to, to get the boat to shore quicker. I'm not sure exactly what they expected him to do. But they didn't have a, a place or a file in their brains that expected Jesus to stand up and reprimand the wind as if it were a living, breathing being. And then to tell the waves to quiet down, to be still, and that the wind and the waves would listen to him. I mean, who has that kind of power and authority? I mean, you and I, we, again, we can't go out command the weather. Because if we could, we would have last week, right? I mean, I tried, and it didn't work. Further proving that I am not God. I mean, okay, you could try it and get, coincidentally, the wind would stop, and you'd have, hey, look what I did. But that's not what happened here. The wind and the waves become still in an instant. Immediately. Immediate obedience. Because as Mark does, he wants his readers to see exactly who Jesus Christ is. And that's exactly what the disciples are starting to see here. That, that this is not a, an ordinary human being. Yes, he's fully man. But he's also fully God. That is the greatness of our God. Where we, where there was a, a great storm, a mega storm, now there is a great or mega calm, the same thing. Same, it's eerily quiet. At least on the outside of the boat, right? And the storm has stopped. And so then Jesus asked this question. They asked him, don't you care? And now Jesus says, why are you so worried? Or in the Greek, why are you so timid? Why are you so cowardly? Where is your faith? Where is your faith? What are you thing in? Because right now it's not me, right? That's the implication. They weren't trusting Jesus in that moment. Because if they were, there would have been peace. They would have been still, like the winds and the waves end up being. And if they were trusting while the winds howled, while the waves roared, they would have been able to be still. They would have been able to, to have peace. They would have found rest. But they weren't there yet. I mean, later they'll get there. Remember Peter before his, his court date? Um, he's asleep when, when the angel comes. Right? And, and that was probably a, a death sentence, but he's a, he's a picture of peace. So, but he's not there yet. He'll get there. But where is your faith? And that's the point here. Jesus is teaching his disciples this, this great lesson that he can be trusted no matter what. Because he is the Almighty God. You don't need to be afraid. Jesus has it. He's in control of all of it. And we need that reminder. Every day of our lives, we look around, we wonder, right? We wonder, in the chaos, don't you care? What are you doing? But the implication from Jesus here is that you don't have to worry if God is in the boat with you. Right? If God is there with you, then what fear? What, what's the point in being afraid? Because God is with you. He is in control of it. He brought you into this storm. He brought you on this trip. And he had a reason for doing it. And he, Obviously, that reason here is to show his power, to show his authority, to show his greatness. Why? So that they would grow in their fear of him and their faith in him. And so that's what we see here. We see a great God who sovereignly allows this great storm, brings about a great calm. But right now, the disciples have very little faith. And that needs to change. Their faith isn't great. And so Jesus lovingly, graciously allows this storm, or even causes it, brings this calm to increase their faith. To show that he is God, to show his power, to show that he can be trusted. And so again, to answer that question, does Jesus care? He absolutely cares. But he cares about what really matters. The storm was less important than the faith of his disciples. Because that's what he is concerned with, growing their faith, strengthening their faith. And that's the point of this trial. 
to show them who he is. And that's the same reason God allows you and me to go through trials. Because he does care for us. And I know that sounds backwards. And my kids would say the same thing because I tell them all, all the time. That, that sometimes I, I make, I don't want to say make life difficult for them. But I don't rescue them from things that seem difficult, like the doctor's appointments, for example. Or sometimes not giving them what they want, giving them the ease that they want, or allowing them to take the easy way out sometimes, right? Make them go and, and do the difficult thing and go upstairs in the dark. Not because I want to torture them, but because I love them, because I care for them, because I want what's best for them. And God does the same thing for you and me. To make our faith stronger, sometimes it's hard things come into our lives. It's the same principle of, of building muscle. You stress that muscle by adding weight or adding repetitions. So you can't lift it anymore, and then you add either weight or repetition. You progressively overload to stimulate growth. If you only lift what you can handle, a five-pound weight two times, it's easy. It makes you feel good. Like, yeah, look, I'm lifting weights, but you're not. I know you're getting exercise advice from a skinny guy. But underneath, I'm just kidding. Um, but if you only lift what you can handle, what's comfortable, then you're not stressing your muscles enough to adapt and grow. They don't get stronger. God does the same thing with us. That's why you read in James 1, count it all joy, he says, when you meet trials of various kinds. We always thought, think that that's a typo, right? Count it all joy when you, you meet trials of various kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Or in Romans 5, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. That's the idea. God wants to strengthen your faith. He wants you to lean on, lean on him. Job, in re the response to, to the trials he faced, he says, he knows the way that I take. When he's tried me, I shall come out as gold. Trials are used to develop that faith. They're used to help us see Christ more clearly so that we might lean on him more fully. It's all about our maturity. And that's what the disciples needed here in this moment. Jesus had been teaching them in parables, and now they get an object lesson. They get a hands-on demonstration of Christ's power. And so Jesus says, why are you so timid? Where is your faith? In other words, don't you understand who I am? Don't you see me? Haven't you seen who I am? Haven't you seen what I can do? And I know many of you are dealing with struggles and, and trials and Many that some that I know about, some that many probably more that I don't know about. And there are always uncertainties in life. And there are physical limitations, emotional struggles, spiritual battles. There are decisions that have to be made. Things that wear us down. And in those moments, you wonder, what is God doing? Does he care? Maybe you, maybe you deal with anxiety or, or depression or discouragement, disappointment. Maybe you feel like you can't do anything right anymore. Maybe you have too much on your plate. Your life is so busy, you just want it to slow down. Maybe you're in pain. Maybe you can't sleep. Chronic illness. Maybe you're dealing with something that you haven't told anybody about. And you wonder, where's God? Why is he asleep? Why is he so far away? Does he really care? I hope you see, yes, he does care. He cares about your faith. He cares about you growing in him. He cares about you seeing him more clearly. So wherever you are today, whatever it is that you are dealing with, or whatever it is that you'll go through in the future, know that God is working, that he's not absent, that he is doing thousands, perhaps thousands of different things in that trial that you may never actually know about. But one thing that you can know about that you can know that he's doing is he's drawing you closer to himself. He's seeking to increase your faith. He's seeking, you, he's seeking to bring you to him so that you would see him more clearly. 
So sometimes to increase that trust, to increase that faith, the trial doesn't go away. Sometimes he doesn't take away the adversity or the hardship. And if, even if he does, he still wants you to trust him. We see that in Paul's life, right? Uh, in, in 2 Corinthians 12, in verses 7 through 9, Paul says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations that I had, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. And he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. So he's like, Lord, take, take this away. Take it away. Take it away. And God didn't. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Or my grace is enough. For you don't need this to go away. What you need is my grace. What you need is me. Paul, for my power is made perfect in that weakness. And so Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the, uh, all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so God wants us to see that even in that trial, even if we feel like giving up, that God is enough. No matter what situation we find ourselves in, God is enough. That we don't necessarily need the trial to go away. What we need is Him. What we need is His grace. And so Jesus wants you to trust Him. And why should you trust Him? Because He is the Almighty God, the one who has the power to silence the storm. He's unlike anyone or anything else. And so we see a great storm, a great calm, a great fear, which is what we see next, is a great fear. That's the response to what Jesus has done. Because they're in the presence of a great God. In verse 41, and they feared exceedingly. And they said one to another, what manner of man is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. That's a great God there. Who uses a great storm and a great calm to produce something. To produce a great fear that will lead to a greater faith. Because you know their faith was weak. It was lacking, and they needed a greater faith. So that's what Jesus is doing for them. And now it literally reads, they, they feared with great fear. This is a greater fear than, than anything so far. This is the most fearful they've been in this whole ride, is now. Why are they so scared? The storm is over, but now they realize something that Jesus is profoundly different than any teacher they have ever met. That he is Lord. They're standing in his presence. Right? They're standing in the presence of the one that we read about in Colossians 1, the beginning of this year. The image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. The one who created all things. Whether visible or invisible. The one whom all things were created for. And the one who holds together all things. That's who they're looking at. That's, they're staring into his eyes and he's staring back at them. They're now more aware of his majesty, his holiness and authority than they have been before. And they're not comfortable with that. And they shouldn't be. This is the one who spoke the world into existence. So even scarier than that storm that they were in a few minutes ago. Even scarier than that is standing in the presence of Almighty God. Because now they're starting to see. I mean, I know it takes them a while and they go back and forth. They fluctuate. But this is no ordinary man. This is the creator, sustainer, controller of all things. Nobody else can silence the storm. And he's staring right into their eyes. They're in the presence of the Almighty. And you say, well, they have been the whole time. Yeah, they have. But they're not quite getting it. They haven't come to grips with it, with all that that means. But now they're starting to see a little bit more, and they're shaken. And we would be too. It's, it reminds me of the account in Jonah. And there are a lot of similarities that we don't have the time to get into. But Jonah, of course, runs from God. Winds up on the ship headed, headed to Tarshish, as far away from God's will uh, as humanly possible. 
And so God sends a storm and it, it rages on until Jonah says, hey guys, you need to throw me overboard because I'm the reason why this storm is here. And they're like, ah, we don't know if we want to do that. Eventually he convinces them and they do. And immediately the storm stops. And we read that the sailors feared the Lord exceedingly. Same reaction. It's a fearful thing to be in the presence of God because of who he is, the one with all power, glory, majesty, holiness. God looking at you with no sin. Or he has no sin, but you do. It's a scary thing. He knows all about you. No one can ever be the same when they see God display his awesome power and glory and greatness. It's no different than Isaiah. In Isaiah 6, right? He fears for his life because he's standing in the presence of a holy God. It's a fearful thing to see God in his glory. When Manoah and his wife met the angel of the Lord prior to the birth of Samson, Manoah says to his wife, we're going to die because we saw God. That's the idea. We need to see God. Jesus says, where's your faith? And he says, to them, he says that because he's saying, don't you realize who I am? Don't you see me? Don't you understand? And then he shows them. He showed them. And, and they're starting to see now. They're starting to fear now. And that's going to strengthen their faith. What manner of man is this, they say? That even the winds and the waves obey him. Who in the world can do this? Only God can do this. We read in a bunch of places in the Psalms. I'll just read a couple of them. Psalm 89, verses 8 and 9. O Lord, God of hosts, who is you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Psalm 65, 5 through 8. By awesome deeds. You answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation. The hope of all the ends of the earth are, and of the farthest seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening shout for joy. If you read Psalm 107 too, um, he maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. And so, again, the in, in, inescapable conclusion that these men have to come to terms with, and that you and I must as well, is that this is Almighty God. And He's standing in the boat with them. So what do we do with this? How do we respond to this? What does Jesus want us to take away from this? He wants us to fear him so that we might have greater faith in him. We're just, really, you could go to Psalm 46. I'm not going to go there, but that's the idea. That's the idea that we take from this. But God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will we not fear? And it says, if the earth be removed, the mountains be carried into the sea, though the waters roar, mountains shake, Heathen rage, kingdoms move, but he utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, it says there. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And then it says, he makes the wars to cease. And then in verse 10 is the one that I really want to get point, point out, is be still and know that I'm God. Right? That's the idea. Know that he is God and he can be trusted. If they knew that, they would have been still. But they had to wait until the waves were still before they became still. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. And that's what Jesus is teaching here. Be still and know that he is God. Trust him in the trial. Trust him in the tribulations. When everything around you might be collapsing and falling apart, God is there with you. If you are on the boat with him, he has not left you. It may be uncomfortable sometimes, but God is there. And we need to see him. 
We need to be in fear of him, in awe of him, so that we might have faith in him. And that's where Jesus wanted his followers here, because that's where faith happens. And like I said, fear and faith are essential. They're not the opposites that we think that they are. Fear is misplaced faith oftentimes. It's looking around at other things, thinking that they're greater than God. Thinking the trial is greater than God. That the storm is greater than God. Biblical faith is a fear of God that puts everything else in its place. Puts those fears in their place. You can fear the diagnosis, the rejection, or whatever else. But take those to God. And let Him put them in their place. Don't let those things ruin you. Fear God who is greater than those things. It's that type of faith that led David to slay Goliath. Everybody else was fearful. It's that type of faith that Jesus is teaching his disciples here. And it's working because now they're starting to fear the one that they should fear. Now that they've seen Jesus, they've never been so scared in their lives. And Mark wants us to have the same reaction. God wants us to have the same reaction. Remember, when this was written, it was written to a church in Rome that was dealing with fearful things, persecutions, trials, difficulties. And God was using Mark to encourage that church to, to persevere. And the only way that they could do that is to understand who they were following, to fear their God and to grow in faith in Him. So God wants you and me to come to the same conclusion here, that, that Jesus is God, that God is greater than the trial, that he's the one who calms the storm, the one who conquers death, the one who willingly left the glories of heaven to die for you and me. And so because Jesus is the God-man who came to take our place, who died and rose again, he's greater than death, he's greater than the storm, he's greater than whatever difficulty you might be facing today. And the disciples are starting to see that. What manner of man is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. What manner of man is that? He is God incarnate. The creator. The one who had spoken the, the universe into being. The one that cast out demons. Who healed diseases. Who overruled the law. Who calmed the sea. Who has the power and authority to forgive. He's greater than all of it. He's greater than the storm. He's greater than the trial in your life. And His grace is greater than your sin. In the middle of the storm, they felt the disciples felt abandoned. And they feared. The church that Mark wrote to probably felt similarly. And they needed to see Jesus in all His glory and all of His greatness. And we need to see that too. Because that's the only way we're going to grow in our faith. It's the only way we're going to trust Him is when we see who He really is that no matter what trials and tribulations may come our way, God is greater. The fear of God leads to greater faith. To grow in our fear and our faith, we must see God for who he is, that he is greater than our trials. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this picture, for this account of, of Jesus and his greatness. And we thank you, Father, for his sovereignty. We thank you, Father, for his holiness. We thank you for his mercy and his grace as well. We thank you that, that he is greater. We thank you that you are greater. Greater than anything that we might be dealing with today. And Father, because of that greatness, because of that holiness, because of that power, help us to fear you with that reverential awe that might move us to a greater faith in you. Help us to trust you even when we don't understand. Help us to trust what you are doing in each one of our lives. Help us to, to lean on you so that we might live for you faithfully. Give us the grace and mercy we need to do that. Give us the power through your spirit to live out that reality, to have that faith, to grow in that faith. Lord, we need you because we know that we are weak. We are flawed. We are much like these disciples and we need your help. And so we ask for that help. And Father, we thank you again for, for bringing us together today, and we pray that as we depart, uh, that you would dismiss us with your blessing, with your grace, and with your safety, and bring us safely back together this evening. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.